Hey, good, good. Thank you. Two, uh, two weeks ago, my wife Rhonda and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. Let me give you more hope than Rick did with 20 to 30 years from now, you might marry. The statistics say that 97 percent of the, of the total population will sometime in their life marry. And that's not uh, taking into account those who marry multiple times, which we're praying that that's not the case for you. In fact, we're only going to allow you one marriage. That's why this is such an important topic for us to be able to talk about today. Rhonda and I uh, have a marriage ministry that we call Between Two Trees. Between Two Trees is the idea of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of time uh, in Genesis chapter 2. And at the end of time in Revelation chapter 22, you find the tree of life again coming from heaven as God brings his kingdom to reign on earth. And the tree of life is there again. And it says that that tree whose leaf is good for the healing of the nations. So the idea is, is the kingdom of heaven comes to earth in the Garden of Eden and God brings the kingdom to earth back again. And the, 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 bum, <laughs> the bummer of it is we live between the two trees. We live in the broken world. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes about that brokenness in Romans 8. He says, he says, like all of creation around us, everything that we see uh, is groaning, waiting for the day of redemption. It, it, all of creation knows what it was created to be. I mean, Kauai had to get more beauty in nature than this. But yet at Kauai, I mean, there are floods. There, there is elements in which creation is groaning. There, uh, we've got a friend who's got a coffee plantation here. He's just praying that the bore, uh, the leaf bore that is, coffee bore that is in the uh, Kona area is not going to come to Kauai. I mean, the whole world is groaning, waiting for, for redemption, waiting for what it was created for. That's where we live. Have you been in a relationship where you're just groaning? And you're just going, oh, dang, this is not what relationships are for. And I don't just mean relationships with the opposite sex. I mean, you've been here at Anchor House long enough to know that relationships are not easy. I mean, you have felt the tension of that, of what that really, that experience is. It's not what God created us to be, living in the Garden of Eden, outside of shame, outside of sin, and what God will redeem, but we live between that and the, the beauty of that. The beauty of that is the gospel. The gospel enters into our life between the two trees and gives us the freedom to, to run that way. So, hey, let me give, uh, let me ask you to ask three questions because I don't want to give you a lot of introduction about Rhonda and I and our ministry, uh, but I'd like you to just ask me, ask us three questions. Rhonda will be speaking tomorrow. It's going to be kind of uh, a little more heady today, and then we're going to get down into some of the practical stuff tomorrow. What would you like to know about Rhonda and I and our ministry? Anybody have any questions? Three questions that will help us, help you get to know us. Yes? What got you started on us? We got married. Uh, <laughs> no, actually it didn't. We, you want to answer that yes. quickly? Two more questions about who we are. Uh, where and when did you come to meet? Ah, uh, both of us grew up in Christian homes, and uh, early in our faith, or early in our growing up, there was a sense of, uh, of course we're Christians, of course we're going to become Christians, and we did that. But it wasn't until uh, really our early college days that we really understood what it was to really walk with Jesus. The idea of, of, of accepting Jesus and the idea of following Jesus had two different definitions for us. So great question. And that was true for both of us. Yeah, one more. Yes? Uh, what's your favorite part about what you do? <laughs> well, favorite part is we get to go all over the world and do this. So we, we were just on the North Shore. Uh, we do what we call a, a focused retreat or a an, an marriage intensive. So we have a couple that's really been kind of struggling in their marriage that lives over in the North Shore. 
uh, we went over and spent uh, 10 hours with them, just in intense, focused counseling with them. But, and we love doing that. I mean, we, we finish doing something like that or, or speaking somewhere like this. We look at each other and go, we get to do this. And the beautiful thing is, is we get to do this in places like Kauai and uh, all over the world. So, yeah, we have a lot of fun doing what we're doing, and, and we do it together. So, great question. Thanks. Marriage maps. Do you have a marriage map? Uh, you know, often when, when you hear that kind of a question, in fact, Rick said when the, when the title went up downstairs, some of you were going, marriage map. What that means is they're going to talk about what does it look like to have a road to marriage, you know, where we are now and how do we get to marriage, which is a good map to have. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in the practical side tomorrow. But the truth of the matter is we all have a marriage map, a view of reality. A map is a reflection of reality. From the very beginning of time, uh, one of the very first uh, maps that was ever discovered, ever created, was the map of the city of Babylon. And from that, that city of Babylon, the whole idea of map making began to grow, began to get bigger and bigger. The interesting thing about the, those early maps, two things that I, that I really love about them. One, the, the map of the city of Babylon had the city of Babylon in the center and the rest of the world revolved around it. Everything within the city was fairly explicit. Everything on the outside edges, nobody knew anything about. So it wasn't, you didn't know what there was outside of Babylon. The other thing is often they would have a, a in their maps, they would have a, uh, an area, they would have their city of Babylon, then they would have an area that they kind of knew a little bit about, and then on the outside parameters of that, there would be a sign that says, beyond here, dragons. <laughs> you know, and so it was the idea that says, anything, anything beyond what we don't know is dangerous, and so we've got to step outside of that. How many of you have used uh, some kind of a ma mapping app on your phone, computer? Okay, what are your favorite? What, what, what maps do you use? Google Maps? Apple, Way. Okay, so there's a bunch of them out there. So when we begin to think about that and we begin to realize what they're doing, Google came up with the idea, they call it, said it's a never ending quest for the perfect map. And so what Google has done is Google has placed cameras on animals, on backpackers, on vehicles, all around the world. And wherever those cameras go, they're collecting information because their ambition is to create the perfect map. Not the map that says, well, here's the United States, and the rest of the world is kind of unknown, and outside of that, it's just dangerous. It is the idea that says, no, we want to know explicitly so that you can go anywhere in the world, and you can have a map that will take you there, and you can study it and be able to gain some insight into what is coming there. So they said, uh, by strapping cameras to the backs of intrepid pa uh, hikers, mobilizing users to fact check, you, any time that you are, use their map and you get a, uh, a request from them, they say, hey, listen, help us know if this is accurate or not. They're modeling the world in 3D. Google is uh, moving one step closer to map making perfection. One of the interesting things when we begin to think about that is the idea of what your marriage map looks like and where did it come from. If maps are a reflection of reality, in your mind you have a reflection of what you believe marriage to be. It might be positive, it might be negative. It might come from, uh, from your, your family of origin and your mom and dad and all the marriages around you are just these beautiful loving relationships. It might come from your family of origin and there's brokenness and pain and hurt and shame in the midst of that. Uh, we have friends that, that they, they actually claim that between the two of them, looking at their family history to their, their parents and their grandparents, they have 14 divorces. I mean, when they came into marriage, they brought a map with them that was pretty crazy. Where else do, where else do you get information about what your map of marriage looks like? Anybody? Where's the information come from? Where, how do you get an idea of romance, male, female? What was it? Movies. Yeah. Hollywood gives us a crazy idea. What else? Books. Books. What you read. People. People. Your friends. Other relationships outside of your family that you want. Music. <laughs> How about social media? I mean, once you begin to look at what relationships look like. So we all have this idea of a marriage map. And the idea that we want to talk about this morning is moving in the direction of creating the perfect marriage map. Not a perfect marriage map, meaning that you will have the perfect marriage, but the idea that the perfect marriage did exist. Talk about the, the two trees. 
here in the Garden of Eden, a man named Adam and a woman named Eve are the only couple that ever had the perfect marriage because before Genesis chapter 3, they lived in the garden. There was no sin. There was no selfishness. There was just the two of them and God. And they had this perfect marriage. And yet in the midst of that, as a culture, we have gone so crazy in trying to eat. We, even the word marriage has become meaningless to us. Where does it fit? Who wants it? I mean, the, the, the rise in cohabitation, the changes that have happened in marriage just in your lifetime is incredible. Do you know these two uh, things uh, that happened in Congress in 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, and just recently, the Perfection of Marriage Act. Anybody know anything about either of those? Not when you were born, so. Yeah, before you were born. <laughs> Not this one, though. 1996, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, signed a, a, an act from Congress that said, we will identify in the United States of America that marriage exists between a, one man and one woman for an entire lifetime. That was, the, that was the defense of marriage act. The idea was as a culture, as an American culture, we want to identify what marriage is as something significant, something that it has been for all of history in every civilization. And so they said, that's what we want to do. Just this year in 2020, we, the Congress just passed and President Biden signed an act called the, uh, the, the Protection of Marriage Act. Anybody know what that did? a lot worse. What that did is that said marriage, what we're going to do is we're going to protect uh, marriage, whether that is a man and a woman, two women, two men. Ultimately, what it does is it opens the field for uh, polygamy, as many husbands, wives as you want. It opens the door for the idea of polyamorous love relationships, which means you can have uh, you can love and have sex with as many people as you want, and the government, the United States, the society, the culture will receive that and say, that's fine. In fact, it's good. Yeah, it's not illegal. Exactly. And so as we begin to watch that, what happens in the Congress doesn't take long, and in the culture and society doesn't take long until it penetrates the church. And the churches all around us are beginning to have the same attitude as the United States Congress and the, and the liberal culture around us has, accepting all kinds of marriage. It's not a problem, though. From the very beginning of time, marriage has been in that controversial state. It, it has been accepted, but there have always been people that have been asking the questions, hey, listen, I know what marriage is supposed to be, but could I just change it a little bit and make marriage or make my marriage like this? And that's where the, the majority of teaching about marriage in the scripture comes from. Jesus didn't just come up with a seminar that he was going to do uh, on, this, on the Sea of Galilee about marriage and said, hey, I'm going to teach you what marriage is all about. Jesus did most of his teaching about marriage as he was taught in the middle of a controversial uh, debate with the leaders of the culture and the society. Matthew 19, uh, in the culture, there's this argument about what, what was the proper way if you wanted to end your marriage, if you wanted a divorce, what could you do to have a divorce that God would honor? If you go back to the, the Old Testament, uh, Malachi says, uh, in Malachi 2, God is speaking and he says this. He says, I hate divorce. Now, that does not mean that God hates divorced people, but what that says is God says, I hate what divorce does to people, to children, to culture, to society. And so in, the, in, in, the, in Jesus' times, the cultural leaders uh, of, of the Jewish community were saying, okay, what qualifies for me to be able to have a divorce? And, uh, and Jesus gave them a definition of that. And when Jesus gave them a definition, he explicitly talked about divorce, but he very, very clearly talked about marriage. And when he did, he went back to the very central first statement about, about marriage in Genesis 2.24. Anybody know that verse? You've heard it at weddings before? A man shall leave his mother and father shall cleave to his, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh. So the idea is, is Jesus says, hey, listen, guys. I mean, he's talking to the, the lawyers, the spiritual leaders of the Jewish synagogues, everything. And he, and he puts it this way. He says, hey, 
Haven't you ever heard this one before? I mean, what I just did with you guys and said, I gave you the start. Jesus said, hey, have you guys ever heard this one before? I don't know if he gave them a few hints, but he said, from the very beginning, God started marriage this way. A man will leave his father and mother. A man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked and unashamed. Um, same thing happened for the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul writes all of the information that we have about Christian marriage uh, beginning at Ephesians 5. Uh, we find it in Colossians. Peter kind of copies him in 1 Peter 5. And all of that information is because there is a debate on what marriage should look like in the church. Because a lot of people were coming from outside uh, into the church and, and they were, were looking for what it would be like. They were arguing about whether men and women should have equal rights whether you should have equal rights if you were a Jew, a Gentile, if you were a slave or free. And Paul is writing and he says, hey, listen, let me tell you what. This whole idea of the church is a reflection of what marriage is and what marriage has been in the very beginning. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul is not writing information about marriage for the sake of marriage. He's writing information about marriage for what he and what God really wants the church to be. Have you ever been in a church that has arguments or been in a church when you look back on it and, and you reflect and you go, boy, there were people that were outsiders and there were people that are insiders. Paul's writing and he says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. And so he said, let's bring it together. And he goes back and he says, what it needs to be is like it was in Genesis 2.24. You ever heard that verse before? What does it say? A man shall leave, leave his father and mother, cleave to his, and the two shall become one flesh. So he, he goes back to the beginning. Moses, again, is writing the first five books of the Old Testament. Anybody know the name of those five books? Have you covered that in, in classes yet? What was it? The Pentateuch, the first five books, absolutely. And so what that is, Moses is writing the Pentateuch because the people of Israel are coming out of slavery in Egypt, being taken by God into the Promised Land, into Palestine. And so in, in that, they're coming into a culture that's different than anything that they've ever known before. And as they come into that culture, Moses is saying this, by God's command, he said, hey, let me remind you who you are as Jewish folks. And he takes them back and he says, let me remind you, uh, your father, great, 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 great grandfather, Abraham, Sarah, he takes them back to Abraham. He takes them back all the way back to the beginning, to creation. And he says, let me remind you, not only are you a people set apart in Abraham, you are people who are created by God to be part of his kingdom. And what he does when he's writing that, he tells the story in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And he says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I want you to think for a minute. Have you ever thought about the idea of Genesis Chapter 1, let's start with 1-1. One, one. In the beginning, God did what? Created. created. You, ever, you ever ask yourself the question, why did God create? What do you think God created? I mean, here, here is God in heaven. There's no world. There's no earth. There's just heaven and heavenly beings. And God just goes, I got an idea. No, I mean, why do you think God created his nature to create. Good. For his glory. What does that mean? Okay, take a poke at it. Needed somebody to praise him. He needed to reveal who he is. God is creative. God is a God of glory, which means that if you see him, it's like you're overwhelmed. It's like God reveals who he is, and when he does, it's glory. Tell me your name. Uh, Nick. Nick. He reveals his glory. Just as Nick said, it's, it, it's to glorify him. When we talk about glorifying God, what it means is we make God look good. And it's not just that we make God look good and it's like, hey, is it cool? I've got a good God. Maybe you don't. It is the idea that God is good and we reveal who he is. And so when God creates, from the very beginning, he has a purpose in mind. He begins to unfold those those days of creation. How many days of creation were there? Six. Six, a trick question. Often we'll go seven. 
Uh, but the, only those first six days were the days that God created. And, and on each of those days, he made just a little bit more. Because at each of those days, one of the, one of the principles of Scripture is that God not only is a God of re revelation that reveals himself, but he reveals himself progressively, a little bit at a time. You don't see that anywhere as clearly as you do in the idea of God's creation on the six days when he created the earth. Day one, God creates the light and the darkness. And at the end of that day, he said what? It is good. It is good. Day two, he separates the waters. Day three, day four, day five, day six. And at the end of every day, he says what? It's good. It's good. I mean, is that like a report card? You know? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, God gets a report card, and it's like, A plus. God, you did good. Proud of you, boy. No, he took pleasure in it. He took pleasure in it? Absolutely. The word good that's used there in Genesis is the, it's the Hebrew word tov. It's the Hebrew there in the, in the English. It would be T-O-V, or uh, it's actually the, the V and the B kind of sound a little bit alike. But the idea is that it is good, beautiful, complete. For a long time, I read that in Genesis chapter 1, where God created in the end of every day. He finished what he was doing, and he said, it's good. It's like, good boy. God does good work. Of course God does good work. God does quality work. Everything that he does is quality. But what is really being said there is not only quality and beauty and pleasure, but it is the idea that says, I have done what I intended to do. I completed the task. Day one, when God created the light and separated it from the darkness, what did he intend to do? What was it? Create light, light and dark. For what reason? So that man could come. So the man could come. But in the bigger picture, what did he do? Nick, what, why did God do that? Give me your so, same answer. To glorify. to glorify himself. He wanted to reveal something about himself. Day two, he separated the waters from the, from the dry land. Why did God do that? To glorify, to glorify himself. Every day, God progressively was glorifying more and showing more and more about himself. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says this, that God took the invisible thing, or took the visible things that he has made to show the invisible things about who he is. Was that just? 120, Romans 120. And so when you get to, to, to look out these windows, I don't know how you study and how you pay attention in here. Uh, somebody was watching, uh, you know, the World Cup, so that's a tough one. But when you look out these windows, you know, and, you, and, you, and you're looking at this beauty around you, and it's like God is revealing things about him by what he has made, invisible things about him, his glory, his beauty, his diversity, all of these things. And every day God's showing a little bit more about himself, and at the end of each day, he says this, it's good. I did what I intended to do. I showed a little bit more day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Who is this God that is doing that? Who is he? Well, we know more about him on day six than we did on day one, and day one more than we did before creation began because God is revealing things about himself. Uh, do you know the, the, the Psalm 19, 19 1 says, the heavens declare the glory, of, the glory God. of God. All of creation is declaring God's glory, just as Nick has told us. And so as we walk through that, we're seeing what God is revealing, and so we should know who this God is. Genesis 1.20. Anybody have a Bible with you that you can jump to Genesis 1.20 and read it loud for me? I hope I got the right address there. Yes, right here, real loud. <coughs> and God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the sky, uh, across the expanse of the sky. That's a great one, but I do have the wrong one. <laughs> um, I'm just going to skip over that. Thank you very much. But the verse that I'm looking for is when God makes the declaration, he says this, let us make man in 
our image. Genesis and then, 127. 127. Thank you, Jen. Genesis 127, let us make man in our image. And in the image of God, he made him, male and female, he made them. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of debate going on today about pronouns. That's a pretty confusing list of pronouns. And God said, let us make man in our image. And in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. There's a lot of stuff going on there. What are we supposed to take away from that? Who is this God that has been doing this creation now for six and a half days? Who is he? He's more than one person. It's more than one person. Let us make man in our image. This is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Genesis 127, the idea of the Trinity is not explained there. That is not, if you, if you go to the Hebrew Bible, that's not necessarily what is being said in that verse. But when we reflect on that through this idea of progressive revelation into the old, through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, we know that this is the idea of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three different persons, yet one God. How do you explain that? Best answer is, it's a mystery. I don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery. I mean, if we could explain all the mysteries about God, we would be God and he would not be. Because there's things that God still holds as mysteries that we'll never understand because they're way beyond us. The idea here is that in the Trinity, you have the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son are distinct from each other. There's a distinction between the Father and the Spirit and the Son. and the Spirit. There's this, this triangular idea here, and yet all three are God. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Isn't that interesting to think through that, what that looks like, and how we begin to understand that? The uh, expression here, I'm going to skip to this one. Uh, Athanasius was a, a third century, between the third and fourth century uh, church father. He explains it this way. He says, unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, God, therefore, be, uh, he, the, the man that will be saved, let him thus think of the Trinity. So the idea that there is a Trinitarian God who is creating, and as he creates, he makes this statement. Let us make man in our image. What day is it in creation? Six. Day, seven's a day of rest. Day six. Halfway through day six, God is creating. And he says, let us make man. And we read then in Genesis chapter two, it says that he, that he made Adam, the male. And what did he say? He said, I can do better than that. And then he made a woman. No, that's not it. What did God say when he said that, that it is not good for man to be alone? It is not good. Does that mean that Adam is not of quality? That Adam is not beautiful? What does it mean? What? Okay, it, it wasn't good? Didn't glorify God because what? He's not done yet. Day six isn't over. Because what did he say before that in Genesis 1, 27? What was that? Let us, make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. This idea is a community. This idea is a relationship. This idea is a love relationship. We get all the way through day six. God has made all of the creation around us, and there's still one thing that we don't know about God. We don't know that he is a God of relationship. We don't know that he is a God of love. Until day six, halfway through, he makes Adam, the man, and he says, I'm not done yet. And he gives Adam a job, and then he brings Eve. But the idea is, is that what God said is, let's reveal who we are as a God of love, a God who's in relationship, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not just a cool diagram. This is a picture of community. This is relationship. This is what, this is, what is happening at the anchor. I mean, you guys came. How many of you knew somebody in this room before you got here? How many didn't know anybody in the room before you got here? Yeah. 
And yet God is bringing you together in community because the marriage relationship and what God creates for Adam and Eve is the prototype of all relationships, including this, the anchor, the body of Christ. But the picture begins with Adam and Eve in the garden, in the marriage relationship. It's the father, the same as the son. It's the son, the same as the, as the spirit. No. Is Nick the same as Rick? No. Definitely not, right? <laughs> There's distinctions, and yet is there a unity that the spirit brings at the anchor? That's what God's talking about for the marriage relationship for Adam and Eve, and as he establishes the marriage relationship. Because what we find is in Genesis 2.24, this phrase. Anybody uh, an English major or know a lot about uh, English grammar and the way things are made up? What is this, this phrase called? Anybody know? It's a causal phrase. It means that whatever comes before this caused this. For this reason, or it says some places, uh, uh, for this cause, or therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. What do you notice about that that makes it not fit in the Genesis narrative, the Genesis story? What do you notice? The word father and mother. Is he talking about Adam and Eve here? Nope. He's talking about every marriage that comes out of, after this and every community that comes after this. And he says, because this over here happened, this will happen in community beginning with the marriage relationship. What is he talking about over here that happened? For this cause, or um, uh, let us make man in our image. The idea, I mean, we, we're hearing a lot in, right now about all the conversations about abortion and the Imago Dei, the image of man our image of God and man. The image of God and man exists in every individual human. But this tells us that what God is saying is that the image of God exists in who we are when we are com come together. Beginning with a marriage relationship, then express what that looks like in the relationship that's called the body of Christ. And so it begins to come together. It's, uh, it's a little bit like this. Anybody recognize her? Anybody know where she lives? Paris, in the Louvre. Anybody know what it would cost you to buy this? Way too much. Way too much. <laughs> yeah, right now it's about 24 million, I think, was the, the last pricing that I saw on this. Let's just imagine going 20 or 30 years that Rick said, and you're getting married, and uh, you're with your, your, your new uh, spouse, and you're opening wedding gifts, and one of the gifts that you open, you unwrap it, and it's the Mona Lisa. Rick and all the staff at, uh, here at the Anchor went to Paris, bought it, gave it to you for a wedding gift. Stole it. Yeah, stole it, <laughs> stole it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with that painting? Give it back to him. <laughs> sell it. That's, yeah, that's usually the guy's answer, sell it. If you don't sell it, what are you going to do? Probably you're going to look at each other, husband and wife, and you're going to say, hey, listen, this is worth $24 million. We need to insure this. We need to protect this. We need to do everything that we can. And when our friends come over, it's like, hey, you want to see my Leonardo da Vinci? I mean, you're going to show it off. And God said, let us make man in our image. And in the image of God, he made him male and female. He made them. And he brought them together. And he called it marriage. One of the, one of the beautiful uh, illustrations is, is this one that I absolutely love. So this is the word perichoresis. Perichoresis. Can you see this enough to tell what's going on there? Not very big. Yeah. These are a bunch of Jewish men dancing. You ever watched Jews dance? No, it's kind of like that, you know. I mean, it is amazing to watch him. And then all of a sudden, they begin putting their hands on each other's shoulders, and it's, and they're going faster and faster and faster and faster until it finally it's looking, and everybody is in perfect step, unless I'm there. Everybody is in perfect step, and it's like, wow, that is a lot of people doing that, and they're all staying together. And isn't it amazing? It almost looks like it's just one giant circle. 
Perichoresis, this word here is the word where we get choreography, dancing. Para is the idea of dancing together. That is the word that was used for the, the description of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This idea back here, not in an illustration, but in the beauty of this dance that's going on and the music that's going on is the perichoresis, the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is what marriage is to be. That a man and a woman come together and the sense of relationship between them, they're distinct from each other, male, female, personality, temperament, all of these things. And yet in the midst of it, they're dancing and they're spinning. And it's like, sometimes when I see them, I, I, I see Rhonda. Sometimes I see Kurt. Sometimes I, I see both of them. I, sometimes it's like I can't tell the difference. Because God says, I want you to be the image of who we are as a God of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so he says, for this cause, because I want you to be this now. A man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Perichoresis. Question. What's the word in the verse that matches that, that you're talking about? Aha. Perichoresis? That is not there. The very good question. Get there. Perichoresis is a Greek term. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. It's a theological term that the, that the church fathers used in the early days of the Christian church to describe this idea of the dance or the relationship of the Trinity. Great question. How do you spell it in English? P-E-R-I-C-O-R-A-S-I-S. -S. Perichoresis. So as we begin to look at that, we begin to realize what it means at the end of that verse when it says that the man and his wife are both naked and unashamed. Because there's nothing that is dividing the sense of the Holy Trinity. There's nothing in the garden that is dividing Adam and Eve. Let me ask you a very interesting question. Do you think there was any tension in the relationship between Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 2, in the garden, before sin? Do you think there was any tension between them? Yes? No? no? Some say yes, some say no. Let me tell you this. He was a man, she was a woman. Do you think there was any tension? I mean, there, there's differences there, but it's not sinful. Are there differences between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah. Is there tension between the Trinity? Not conflict, not sin, but tension. Let me ask you this. Have you ever read the story at Easter when Jesus is in the garden and he's praying? and he's sweating drops of blood, and he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There is no sin, but there is distinct persons. That is the perichoresis. When a couple come together and they marry, the two become one flesh. Everything about them becomes one. We said that the uh, idea of the marriage is the, uh, the, the, the beginning point of what the church should look like. How do we overcome that sense of our differences? It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit that comes in us. The idea of being naked with each other. So the idea of that, uh, that passage then comes to this place. These three components in the marriage relationship, passion, commitment, and intimacy. I tell you what, we all understand. How, I was going to ask if anybody's fallen in love in here. We're not going to ask for that. But when you fall in love, it is that sense of passion. When you look across the room, you see her, you see him, and it's like, it takes my breath away. I can't believe it. Or you, or you experience them, and it's just like, this is so amazing. That is the sense of passion, which is our similarities and our differences. In the body of Christ and in the marriage relationship, we come together, and it's the passion that's driving us. In a marriage relationship, if passion is driving us somewhere, if we're being pulled by passion when we fall in love, where are we being pulled to? What's passion taking us towards? Intimacy. I mean, in our minds, we, uh, we more often think of the idea of intimacy uh, just in the sense of sexual intimacy, but intimacy is so much more. Intimacy of, of body, yes, but soul, spirit, mind. 
All of those things that God is drawing you into that sense of oneness in marriage. So how do you get there? How do you move from passion to intimacy in a relationship, particularly a marriage relationship? The only way to get there is by vulnerability. Openness, honesty, clarity of thought. The sense that says, no, I, I want to serve you, therefore I am vulnerable before you. Happens in the body of Christ, but it really happens in, in an intimate way within the marriage relationship. And so we're driven to that idea that, that we, the only time that it is safe to be completely naked is how? Either living in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve had no sin, no selfishness, or in a committed relationship that says, I'm here for the rest of my life. I will not walk away. No matter what I find out about you, no matter what and how you hurt me, I will not walk away. I am committed to you for the rest of my life. The passion drives us there, but the only, and the only way that we can get there is by vulnerability, by being naked with each other, but the only way that it's the only place that it's safe to be naked is in a committed relationship. And so we move from passion to intimacy by the road of vulnerability, moving towards the sense of commitment. So let me ask you this. This. I think it's sleeping. It's frozen. Do you have a marriage map? Are you working on the marriage map? Do you have an understanding of what marriage is more than just what you've been handed by everybody around you, handed by the media, handed by movies, handed by hurtful situations in your own home? Do you have an idea of what marriage is? Yeah. God has given you one. One of the things that's most necessary and that we would pray for you during your time here at the Anchor House is to is to have a lot of conversations about this idea, about marriage. How are you going to have those? Oh, there we go. How are you going to have those? Well, you're going to have to be in a committed relationship where you know it's safe enough to be vulnerable, but you're going to be able to have those. You're going to have those with some of the, uh, the principles with Rick, some of the speakers that come, some of you with each other. Because the idea is, I have no idea why that's doing that. Um, the idea is that you have a marriage map whether you know it or not. What we're trying to do is say, know it. Shape it. Do as good as Google does. Collect as much information as you can to move towards the perfect marriage map. Now, that is not the perfect marriage. It happened once in history, Adam and Eve. 45 years, uh, Rhonda and I do not have a perfect marriage by far. I'm in the marriage. That, it's one good giveaway there. But can you have the perfect marriage map? You know, every time you go back to the scripture and say, what is it that God said about marriage? What is the thing in Genesis that's all about? Marriage doesn't need to be defended and protected by Congress, but lived out. And I'll tell you what, my greatest hope is in your generation. It's you guys are watching what's going on around you, and you're saying, no, we're going to do it different. We're going to make this different. I've got a couple more ideas that, uh, to share with you, but I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions, comments, concerns, heresies. Yeah. What Bible translation do you use? That's about three or four different Bible translations, New International, uh, New American Standard, and I think there probably is a couple places where the, the message, the paraphrase, the message is there. Yeah. Jen. Great. That seems to be very man-focused. Great question. Great question. So what is, the, what is the focus of that verse? Well, the cultural focus is exactly what you're talking about there where it's saying in the culture, typically what would happen is the man would leave his father and mother, would take his wife and bring her back to, to live with the mother and father, his mother and father in his home. And the, the male part of the relationship. One of the things that comes when we come to the New Testament 
And we come to the idea of what marriage looks like in the church and what marriage looks like for us today. Is that idea that, that, uh, that we talked about earlier in Galatians, uh, I think it's Galatians 5, where Paul is writing and he says, there is no male, female. There is no slave or free, Greek or Jew, you know, but we are one in Christ. If marriage is the prototype of the body of Christ, then there ought to be a correlation between those two things, and there is. Paul in Ephesians 5 is writing, and remember he said that Paul is not writing there. He's not saying, hey, I'm going to write to the Ephesians and tell them about marriage. What is Paul talking about in the whole book of Ephesians? He's talking about oneness, that the body of Christ is one. So what does he say the, to, to the husbands and wives? He says, uh, he, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, be willing to sacrifice your very life for your wife. Oh, good. So it's bringing us back to this point. He's saying to husbands and wives in that setting, he's saying, move into this vulnerable area. Women be willing, wives be willing to follow your husband's leadership and make yourself vulnerable. Men, be willing to die to serve your wife just like Christ did for the church. He's not saying one is better. We look at that from a Western mindset as, as Western Christians, and we think that that's a hierarchical chart we think it's an org chart for what marriage looks like. Paul is not trying to talk about an org chart for marriage there. Paul's talking about oneness in the church and oneness in marriage. And so what he says is, if you want to be intimate, the only way to be intimate is becoming vulnerable. Women, this is how you'll become vulnerable. Men, this is how you'll become vulnerable. It is not the idea, this is how do we argue over which is hardest, because both I think, according to Paul, both are going to be equally hard because we're both entering into this idea of nakedness. Because we have a higher view of oneness than we do individuality. Our culture today has said, no, it's all about what I want. If, if, as I enter into marriage, if I'm getting what I want, then I'm satisfied. If I'm not getting what I want, then I'm not satisfied in the marriage. We're, we're the biblical Christian view of marriage is the idea that says we both enter into it, not with the idea of individualism, but union. One of the interesting things, as I read the New Testament, and I read the Old and New Testament about marriage, is that the idea of oneness isn't like work really hard to have oneness in the anchor house. If you guys work hard enough, by the time you get to May, you'll be one. Or Rhonda and Kurt, work in your marriage so that you can be one. What scripture says is, you are made in the image of God. Therefore, when you come together, you are one. It's not work hard to be one. Recognize that you are one. Anchor house? Boy, when, you, when you're looking at those other people and it just seems like they're slacking and not doing their chore, or it's just going, that person's sense of humor just irritates me. Recognize that in the midst of all of that, it's not like, hey, if you work hard enough, you can be one. The scripture is teaching and saying, no, recognize you are one. And then live that way. And I think that, I think that uh, we get really confused because we want to look at this uh, from a, a Western American 21st century management perspective in Genesis 5. And it's not about that. It's about the idea of the union of marriage. Man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. How? And the man and his wife were both naked and unashamed, therefore able to enter into them. Any other questions? Yes? Why does the Bible put such a big emphasis on marriage? Great question. Why does the Bible put such a big emphasis? Anybody else be able to answer that? Because why, why, why is this even important enough for Anchor House leadership to say, hey, listen, let's talk about that? Why is, why is, is marriage more important than singleness? Okay, there's, there is a, yeah, not only uh, when they become one, there's actually some babies that are going to come out of this. Very good answer, yes. Because we're in a marriage to God. Okay, because it illustrates the idea in the New Testament, the marriage, I mean, actually Old and New Testament, there's these parallels that says Israel is like the bride of God, and God is the husband, and then New Testament, absolutely, yeah, yes. We're designed for it. We're designed for it, so we're, absolutely, we're actually made for it. 
I mean, the way that our bodies are made, the way that our souls are made, the way that we are made in the image of God, we are designed for relationship. And ultimately, that relationship for 97% of us will at some point be in the expression of marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody have a hand over here? Absolutely. Yeah. So again, does Rhonda... I'm not going to assume that this part of your question, but often the, the, the fair side of that that says, does the single have value in the body of Christ? Singleness? Absolutely. God, God designed us. Uh, I mean, I listened to just a part of what Jen was saying, but the idea that says the way that you were designed, uh, that you are particular and have a particular place in the community and you have a particular place uh, in uh in relationships, in your giftedness, in the kingdom. Um, the one danger that I would say is that danger of, of where we live in a culture that is so individualistic that it says, listen, don't consider the marriage thing, consider only the single thing. It is the idea that says, no, both have great value. And marriage becomes this idea. It is not the idea that you are valued more because you are married or you're valued more because you're single, it is the idea that you are now part of the body of Christ. One of the things for a single person that's incredibly important is if they're not married and they spend their whole life single, that they find a place in the body of Christ where they are experiencing this. And it is responsibility of the body of Christ for every individual married or single is included in this idea of this intimacy and oneness. Five minutes. Question over here? Somebody? No? Yeah. Um, we were just talking about the mission field like a little while ago. How important do you think it is to be married going into the mission field, or do you think it's helpful to not be married going into the mission field? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, 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 th I think both. I, I think one, it depends on where you're going. I think there are some places that it's going to be better if you're single. Uh, you're going. I mean, Paul in his writing about singleness. He says that, that a single person has an advantage because they can be fully devoted to the Lord in what they're doing. Where a married person on the mission field is going, okay, I gotta worry that my family is safe, I gotta worry that they have food, I gotta worry that they, that they are being taken care of. Where the single person is going, hey listen, I'm all out for just, just not even having to think about that. I can concentrate and be fully devoted to the Lord. So I, better or worse, I don't think so. I think that uh, I think the, the answer to the question is wisdom, uh, wisdom of the people that are sending you, uh, wisdom on the need that is there, and, and, and you're being honest about your own needs in that, you know, where and how that fits together. And culture. And culture, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, I'm gonna finish up with that, and uh, tomorrow morning, Rhonda and I are gonna come back we're gonna kind of move from this idea of the, of the marriage map to talk about the idea of uh, when you do fall in love, when that passion grabs a hold of you and you think, this is the person I wanna spend the rest of my life with, I want to move to this place of intimacy, I want to make a commitment, and all of a sudden you realize that, that you have two different marriage maps. You're coming from two different families of origin, two different cultures, two different experiences, and what and how do you bring those marriage maps together? One, in conversation. Two, in the idea that says you're going to live the rest of your lives operating from those maps. Um, most, of you are, most of you haven't finished bachelor's degrees yet. You're, this is kind of getting ready for that and thinking about it. And, uh, how many of you chose Anchor House because of the surfing and this is just kind of secondary? Be honest. Okay, Jen. <laughs> 
So I mean, honestly, when you think about that, so um, who's telling you? Nate, uh, the, the idea of, uh, that he went to Pepperdine University. The only other place that you can go and get a great education and find some great surfing is Pepperdine in Malibu, California. And let's say that, uh, let's say that you really love surfing and uh, there's a place uh, called Point Doom in Malibu. And at the end of Point Doom, there's a place that's called Little Doom. It's a private beach and you have to have a key to get in. But if I had the key and I gave you the map to get there and you chose to go to Pepperdine and I said, listen, here's the key, here's the map. When you get there, go to Little Doom. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's some of the best sur surfing in Southern California and it's private. You're going to love it. You get to Pepperdine and you're, you're in orientation and you're just going, I can't even listen to this stuff. I want to get over there and surf. And, and you, get, you get over on PCH, Pacific Coast Highway, you pull out the map, and what I gave you was a map of Kauai. And it's like, how do I get there from here? This is a bad information. So the idea is when you come together at that place of committing your lives to each other, you're coming with two different maps. How do you bring those maps together? And how do you do that even in the kind of the preparation of a relationship. So Rhonda and I'll talk on that tomorrow. I kind of give you some some real practical tools and things to help you think through that. So all right. Rick. Thank you guys. Thank you. Kurt.